All right, I'm uh, here with Velio, and today we're talking about sustainability beyond materials. How are you doing today? Doing awesome, Ben. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, you bet. You bet. So tell a little bit about your path and how you got to where you are, and then briefly describe kind of the current uh, initiatives you're working on. Yeah, absolutely. So I've been in packaging for uh, know, over 15 years. I guess I'd rather say over 15 than saying almost 20, because that makes me feel a little bit younger. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been doing packaging for a long time. Uh, I work typically with um, high-end brands, so brands uh, like Michael Kors, Tiffany, uh, Google, so those types of those types of brands, uh, whether it's retail packaging or product packaging. I've been doing that for a really long time, um, usually working on either supporting agencies or supporting manufacturers. Um, so having done that for so long, I've been able to see a lot of packaging production, seeing what happens to packaging, seeing what happens to the waste after packaging, um, after it's been created, and then what happens to the packaging after it's been used. And through that, um, I think that's kind of where I've, I've started to realize that there's a lot of waste. You know, mm -hmm. I started to realize, but I realized that there had been a lot of waste um, happening and you know, in packaging's, you know, I, I hate to say like in packaging's heyday, but you know, previously when people were just packaging the heck out of products. Uh, you know, it used to be this thing where packaging had all of these different layers, um, you know, for the unboxing. And it's like every, you know, the higher end the product meant the more layers there would be. And really it was like the more waste you were creating. But and it was kind of a perception that that was more premium. It, it seems, uh, right? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And yeah. what happened is then when you go down market there, you know, brands are trying to aspire to feel luxury. So they were, packing in as much packaging as possible too. And it's like all of this waste. Um, and you, know, do you, you think that people that. Would, would keep those or do they just say it's just waste? So when, once it's unboxed, the boxes go away. I mean, yeah. that's typical, right? Well, that's that's funny because from the package, from the design side, you know, there was a term, it was keepsake packaging mm. and people still throw that around. And as you're designing it, you're thinking, this is keepsake packaging. It's really valuable. It, you know, it, it talks about the brand and it, it creates all these emotions. And in your mind, you're thinking people are keeping this. Mm -hmm. And lots of people do keep it. But regardless of how long you keep it, that product's going to a landfill, whether it's as soon as you open it, you know, the day after, or you keep it and you know, when you decide to move, all of a sudden it goes to the landfill. So it's going to the landfill regardless. Um, so do you work backward when you're designing something like that? Are you thinking about that from the beginning, working backward, or do you do work with your customers to just design what they want? Yeah, you know, um, always starting at the end. That's the that, that's at least the process that I've used. And um, I also host a, a podcast, um, Package Design Unboxed. And everybody that I talk to there that focuses on sustainability, we all approach it the same way. We start at the very end. I was like, okay, how is this, how is this pack going to make its way through the recycling system? And then you work your way backwards, right? And it, and it may be that you've got, you know, plastics and paperboard and all these different materials combined, but is there a way to separate those? You know, is it clearly uh, indicated how to separate those pieces? You know, and then you kind of work your way backwards from there. It's like, okay, and then how does it, how does it come together? How does the product fit in there? Um, and you work your way all the way through to production, you know, you know, how, one, how are they going to fulfill it? Is there any waste there? Cause sometimes when you, there's a lot of waste throughout the entire stream. So you might design a beautiful box, but it goes from your box manufacturer to the fulfillment center and they don't just ship it in that box. They've got to pack that in another box. Right. And sometimes there's cartons and then there's master cartons. So, you know, is your box strong enough that it can be packed in just one box without having to have a master carton outside of it to add more strength? Mm. That's two boxes that you're tossing for however many. Um, so a lot of that, you know, you're, you're working your way backwards all the way through that, trying to eliminate as much packaging waste as possible, all the way to manufacturing. You know, is there a way that we can set up a, a die so that if you're cutting this sheet and you know, you've got a large sheet and you're cutting this piece, can we, you know, kind of mirror it so that you can get more out of one and have less waste. Mm. So there's a, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, and I think a lot of times people think of sustainable packaging as I need something that's recyclable. 
you know, I need a, a, a Mobius loop on my box and then I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, you know, that's something that we don't really think about is the whole supply chain and where, where the, how a product gets from one place to another. You know, I, I, I went into a few stores a couple weeks ago, really talking to the, the people on the, you know, who are stocking the shelves, you know, is this recyclable? Is this sustainable? I said, yeah, this is, but to get it here, it was wrapped in five layers of bubble wrap and it came over on a boat from someplace or it came on a train. And so even the, the smallest little recyclable, cool, sustainable box yeah. may need to be packed in a master carton that we'll never see. No one sees that. And right. no one sees that waste and where that goes. So it was very interesting to find, uh, you know, some products or some stores that are not doing that. And it's very hard to, unless you buy locally, you know, it's made locally, you buy locally, and then you hold on to it forever. So yeah. that's uh, that's interesting. So, you know, I really wanted to talk to you also then, thanks for that background about design optimization and how you specifically go about reducing waste, like on a day-to-day -day basis when you're thinking about your designs. Yeah, so with, you know, people talk about uh, design optimization. Um, they talk about lightweighting. Um, and, you know, those two terms aren't necessarily interchangeable, but the overall goal is to think about your product. And for example, you know, this, this iPhone, right? You've got it in a box and the box is as tight around that phone mm -hmm. as possible. Right? You've got a, just a really thin frame around there. Um, and then when that box is going into a master carton to be shipped around, you know, they pack it in a way that it's, it's really tight. You know, they're not trying to create it so that you're creating gaps between boxes and you're shipping air. So they pack them as tight as possible. And then they pack those cartons inside of master cartons as tight as possible. And the math, the geometry of the box really, you know, before you start looking at how big it needs to be around the product, it's going to be shipped on a pallet. So how big is your pallet? If you're moving in a container, how big is that container? You know, you want your boxes to go to the edge of that pallet. And that's mm -hmm. where you start to optimize, right? Can I shave a half inch off this box? Because as that scales out, you know, all of a sudden I'm saving five inches and my, my boxes won't overhang the pallet, mm -hmm. which means that I can put those pallets side by side inside of a shipping container instead of a, a, a train container. Um, you know, and, and those types of things are where we start optimizing it because it's all for size, right? We want them as, as tight as possible. And sometimes, you know, the tightest fit around this product might actually mean that you've got, um, you know, like a three inch gap around mm -hmm. the pallet. So that then leads to, okay, well, if, if maybe I shave a quarter of an inch off of this, then maybe I can fit another row of boxes on there, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of find that balance. Um, and then when we're optimizing, it's not just for the size and pack, um, because you also have to get those, you have to also have to get those pallets out of the container, right? And the interior dimension of the container is different than the door of the container. So you have to kind of big balance those. You're going to be able to get a, a forklift in and out of that. Um, and then depending on where you're storing it, typically it's based off of that internal container dimension. Um, so you're looking at materials, you know, what materials are you using? If you use a stronger corrugate, for example, to pack your your cartons in to use your for your cartons, maybe you don't have to use a master carton, uh, which means you can reduce product there. If you use a stronger um, gray board, for example, a, a chipboard that you build your boxes out of, maybe you can you know you don't have to use as strong of a board on the corrugate to, hmm. to, to build those right. So all these different little things as you're kind of working your way backwards. Um, really make make a big difference. And so, how do you kind of work through the pricing with that? If you, you know, it may be on a train, it may be on a boat, it may be on an airplane. There may be different sizes that you were talking about. How do you work with your customers if you don't know really what the the shipping means is going to be? You know, that's that's part of that first conversation, right? We 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 want to find out when. Um, so, if you've got a product that we need to pack, you know we all want to jump into that romance conversation of brand and storytelling and, you know, just all of the beauty. And that's great. And that's definitely a conversation that's needed, but you have to find out when, you know, when do you need that, when do you need that box? 
That's really important. Timing is critical. Um, where does it need to go? So if I'm producing in Asia and you're fulfilling in Tennessee, for example, it's like, okay, how do I, how do I get it there? Right. Am I landing in, am I landing in Long Beach and training it all the way across the country? Or am I going a different route? Or maybe that just doesn't make sense. I have to put it on an airplane and all those things, you know, impact cost. Um, so it's really, you know, you, you find out what that timeline is, then you can, you make a plan of how you're going to move that product and, and get it there. Uh, because those impact cost. Then we can look at materials. And it's funny because like printing processes typically don't impact costs as much as we think they would, right? Mm -hmm. It's like we've got a four color um, print on a box and, you're, you know, and your customer's like, well, what if we just do three colors instead of four? It's like, well, you're going to save a percentage of a penny. You know, what we really need to do is reduce this box by a quarter of an inch if, if we want to make some kind of an impact. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of times it's, you know, we want to find out what the price point is that the customer needs to be at. Um, and a lot of times when we're having a conversation with a client, there's questions that they're not comfortable with, which is what kind of margins do you have on this product, right? You start getting into their business and they're like, well, you know, maybe I don't want you digging into my underwear drawer, but it's like, no, we got to get in there because if you're, you know, if you've only got 10% margins on this thing, then we really need to look at packaging that's going to, that's going to, you know, help you make more money. Um, you know, we don't want to create $3 packaging when you're only making 10 cents a, uh, on the product. Um, and then that quickly starts to put parameters together of, all right, we need to use folding board. We need to use, you know, four color, you know, four color offset, and we need to you know, make the box a minimum of this size. And it has to be collapsible. And you start going down this checklist of, how to make packaging that's going to be profitable for them. And then as you're kind of working through that, you also start looking at, okay, what materials can I do that are sustainable within those parameters? And, and really the tighter those parameters get, the more creative you can become. So that, so that kind of discovery and the innovation is in there is, do you work with, with your, your customers all the way through or do they already have a set budget, set time, and they say, okay, we want a box? How do you kind of consult in that way to make it successful for everyone? Yeah, so typically it's um, I'd say ninety percent of the time they've got a they've got a timeline, right? They need to launch packaging for holiday twenty twenty, right? And holiday twenty twenty, or let's look at holiday twenty twenty one. If they need to have packaging for holiday twenty twenty one, it needs to be in stores by November first at the latest. Uh, packaging manufacturing is going to take, you know, depending on, on, on what type of packaging we're talking about, it can take four to eight weeks, uh, sometimes longer. So you back yourself out of, you know, from November, you know, go back two months. And then it, depending on where you're producing it, if it's something really technical or if it's something that can be done domestically, you've got all these different options. Um, how long is it going to take it to move that product over? You know, how long is it going to take it to assemble the product and pack the product? And you work your way backwards and the customer might not, might not have a complete timeline, but they've got a due date. And sometimes they don't even understand that for a holiday launch, they need to have it before the holiday and everything that has to happen beforehand. And if it's like an e-com or, you know, D to C, they've got to have it even sooner because then they've got to ship it. They've got to pack it. They've got to ship it. And you work with them on, on timing. Um, so together you build this timeline and it's like, okay, you know, now that we look at it, we really, we only have two weeks for structural design and sampling and maybe one week for art creation and a proof approval. And then we've got to go into production and then, then we've got to go into testing and then you've got to go into you know, fulfillment testing and making sure that the box that's been created and the fulfillment team that you're using, uh, because fulfillment is an added cost. And if they've got to pick up the, the product and open the box and put the product in the box and close the box and seal it. And every step, a lot of times fulfillment centers will account for each step. So if I can design packaging that takes six steps to assemble and fulfill, or there's packaging that takes 12 steps to, to pack and fulfill, the six step one is going to be cheaper on fulfillment. And sometimes that fulfillment cost might be cheaper that might be worth more than the packaging itself. You know, we've seen, that. we've seen the increases over the past six to nine months with pandemic in terms of shipping. 
and it continues to be a challenge. You know, things get backed up on the docks, like you're saying, Long Beach, you know, wherever that is, not, not only because there's traffic that's kind of backed up because there are half the workers that are trying to get the product out. So that 12 step process may be a 24 step process just because of the logistics. And so, you know, we're really trying to work with our, our clients on these projects to look way ahead and really build in this extra time. But sure. it's hard because the customers want to launch, they want to get products on the shelf so that they can, you know, serve their customers and get money in to do, you know, new packaging. And it's a, it's a challenging situation. So, you know, the more that we can work on a consultative manner to educate the customers on timelines and maybe shaving off some steps here and there to save on that is really beneficial right now because it's just, you know, it could be two times or three times as, as long to work on projects. It's just the way that the world is now from what we've seen. So have you seen those timelines on, on your end increase and how do you, how long do you think that'll last? You know, it, it really depends. Um, depending on the client that you're working with, a lot of times clients, if they've got a schedule, if you're working with a client that you've had for a long time, then they've got a set schedule, right? You know when you're receiving artwork, you know when you've got to go to testing. A lot of times what, hap what happens is when you, when you have a new client and you've got to educate them, that's where you're starting to see, you know, that they're coming to you too late. And as, like you're saying, timelines might, might be extended. Um, that's where you're going to have to figure out like a best case scenario for them and kind of work with them and create some options for them. So I'm also working uh, with a team out of, um, out of Asia called idpdirect.com. And we just launched this box for uh, a company in, in the UK called Walpole. And Walpole is like, they're, they're known for the, for British luxury. Like they're, they're, they're the British luxury communication tool basically. Hmm. Um, and they wanted to create, they're like, what is the future of sustainable packaging look like? What does the future of e-commerce look like? Uh, and then together with, with the team at IDP, you again, backing all the way out. It's like, okay, well, how do we create a box? You know, and what they were shipping was this, their annual book. Hmm. And this, this, this book that goes out every year has like, you know, goes to all the different luxury brands. Um, it talks about the future hmm. of fashion and, and luxury and, and all these different areas. And it's like, okay, well, we've got to create something that's super sustainable. Um, what is, you know, what does packaging look like today? What are the concerns that people have, right? And, you know, of course there's, there's the pandemic, there's, uh, you know, just viral transfer. Um, you know, so we looked at some papers that were not only come from hundred percent recycled material, which is difficult to find, uh, but also we wanted to add a coating to it that was antimicrobial. And this coating basically, you know, any, anything that sits on it for over two hours, it kills the bacteria on there. Um, and as we're thinking about e-commerce, and this is something I talk to e-com brands about also is we can add any type of these, you know, silver ion coatings to, to e-com packaging. You know, it hmm. might not kill the germs on it immediately, but if you ship it and it gets to be the next day, it's over the two hour time limit. So by the time I do open that box, the interior of that box should be completely clean. Hmm. You know, I have to, you know, and, and it's just like one more, uh, it's, it's like a, another notch in that sense of security that you can provide to your customers, you know, and, and with this Walpole box, what ended up happening is, you know, designed artwork for it that was multi-level embossed. So it was just all texture. There was no ink on it. And when you receive it, you can feel it. You can feel the texture. Um, you can see the artwork and it covered the entire area of, of, of the box was just this beautiful texture. Hmm. Um, and you feel it, but then when you open it, then there's like this book and the book becomes the hero because there's all the color, all the art is on that book. And that's the other component to like e or the way that we're kind of seeing the future of packaging is it's not about packaging anymore, which seems silly that it it's taken to 2020 to realize that it's not about the packaging. Yeah. It's about the product. The product is the hero. So with this box, as you open it up, everything falls away. And then what's left is like this beautiful book and hmm. presented to you. And you go through the full experience and you enjoy it, the whole process. But the fact that this box can then be disassembled easily and be recycled or is beautiful enough if you want to keep it, um, there's there's just a, a story there. And I think that that's something that a lot of brands are missing. Uh, but I think we're kind of evolving in that direction. That's great. Well, I want to get into marketing in a second, but I do have a question here from Jeffrey that I put up on here. 
um, if you could address this. So when do you typically bring in the equipment and packaging automation? Is it after the design or early on? Uh, uh, there Or, yeah. So, or shipping master packs. So if you could yeah. address those, that'd be great. Yeah, no, that's a great, that's a great question, question Jeff. Um, typically, I like to bring in the production teams as early as possible. So I'll sketch. So I'll, my process is as we're, you know, as I'm talking to you, if you're, if you're my client, if I'm sitting across the table from you and we're talking about your product and kind of your goals, I'll begin sketching, you know, and I'll start putting together just some general ideas. And I'll show those teams like, is this kind of what you're, is this what you're talking about? Is this where we want to go? Um, and as you're, as you're talking, I'll start putting in limitations in here too. It's like, okay, well, if we create this kind of a box, then these are the issues that we might have in production. These are the things that are going to limit us. Uh, pretty much after that meeting, I'm going to reach out to the production team and say, this is kind of where we want to go. What are the issues that you're going to see? What are ways that we can make this? Um, are there any ways that we can automate this? Is there like an automated setup box that you can create? Is there, you know, what are the limitations of your equipment before we even get too far down the line, right? Because I want to show you early early stage concepts mm. and then be able to turn around, talk to production and say, this is our goal. What can we do? And production usually goes, we'll look at it and say like, all right, 90% of that works, but this 10% right here is going to kill your entire um, cost or your timeline or you can't use this material with this production process if that's what you want to do. And then they'll come back with a bunch of ideas of here's what, here's what you need to do in order to get there. Um, then what happens is those sketches are then refined with those ideas from production. And then it goes back to the client. And then uh, usually at that time, the production team uh, can, can meet with and, and talk to the client. So for example, with like the wall pull, it's like we had the, the sketch concepts the idea is then together with um, the IDP direct team sat across them and said, look, this is, these are the limitations. Here's what we can do. And here's what it's going to look like just as a general concept. And we went right into, into sampling and, you know, like they knocked out uh, unprinted samples or, you know, no embossing, no, no texture. And then it gives the customer an opportunity to not only see the idea in sketch, but then also experience it. Right. And once you experience it as a client, like, oh, this, I love this. Or, you're like, I hate this. I thought I loved it in sketch, but I, I, I don't like the way this hinge opens or I don't like yeah. the way that this, you know, it kind of hangs up here or I've got to find a way to tape it closed or whatever it is that they realize, you realize that in that um, white dummy sample stage. So, mm -hmm. so to answer Jeff's question, it's as early as possible, right? We want to bring in production as early as possible. Yeah, I mean, that, that's really what I found is that the, the more that you can get all, everyone on the team, all parties together as soon as possible, looking ahead and coming up with any barriers or challenges, the more successful your project is overall. Yeah, absolutely. So I'd like to talk about marketing a little bit here and how you how you go about that with the projects you work on. Sure. So when I talk about when I talk to clients about marketing and I talk to excuse me, drink some water here. But when I talk to clients about their packaging, it's not just to protect their product. You know, there's also, depending on if the product is going to be on shelf, then it has to be able to, you know, the packaging has to work. You know, the packaging has to sell. It's got to market itself and, you know, give you the claims, give you, you know, at an instant, know what it is and how it competes with the other products. Um, but then even beyond that, as you open it, you know, there has to be this, even though we've reduced the number of layers in the packaging, you have to be able to tell a story. And what that means is when you're you know, on the outside of the box, it's like an introduction, right? It's, it's the, the, sh the handshake. It's like, this is who I am. You know, so you know the brand, you know the product, um, you know some general ideas of, about what it is that you're opening. And as you get into more, as you get into higher end products, that information kind of falls away and it mostly just focuses on brand. Then when you open that, when you open that box, you need to have some kind of a message that welcomes them into the box, right? When, and it's not a matter of like, welcome into my box. It's just like, you know, you have to have some romance information there that lets them know why they made that purchase, right? It just has to validate that so exact what decision. So what would you of that, you know, in terms of the romance or, you know, sure. how, how would you be like, wow, you know, what, what would that, something like that be? Um, you know, like for a lot of uh, D2C brands that are doing like subscription-based uh, products, right? So every month you get something. If you're able to, 
you know, say the outside of the box has your, your brand on it and your artwork on it. Um, so you already know you're getting it, but then when you open it, it's, it, it'll tell you, for example, um, I don't know, let's pick a, a whiskey or, or something, some kind of experience. You open up that box and it's like, uh, it says, um, you know, cheers, Benjamin. It's, it's, you know, uh, happy holidays, Benjamin, or something like that, or maybe it personalizes it to you. So personalizing. Yeah. Personalizing is important. Or, you know, even if it's something like, um, God, I can't, I'm, you're putting me on the spot here, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> you, you want to create live. So <laughs> yeah, no, but you want to, you want to create something that is, um, just it, it, it's, it's in line with the brand in terms of the tone. Um, if it's for like a cosmetic, uh, one brand that does it beautifully is a company out of San Francisco called Benefit Cosmetics. And it'll, it'll say something in there that's like super tongue in cheek, like, um, Hey, beautiful, or, you know, you know, happy to see you. You look, you look amazing or something, you know, something like that as you open it. And it's just like that moment, you know, you're not going to, you're going to see it. You're not necessarily going to stop and like read it and absorb it, but you'll see it enough to get a sense of that personality. And then when you go further in, then there's the, the product and that's the hero, you know, and it's like all those little touches create an opportunity for marketing. And what that marketing then looks like is if somebody's going to take a picture of it, right? If you've given them a reason to show not just the outside of the box, but then the inside of the box and then to show the product. Uh, and then you're seeing people now staging their, their shots, you know, and this is like, you know, like my neighbor or, you know, some, some college student that aren't necessarily photographers, but now they're, they're setting up their, their shots and they're putting the, the box closed and they're showing the box open and they're showing the product next to it. And that's creating marketing. That's creating a lot of buzz. You know, it's the share worthy packaging. That's yeah. like, like, that's like, like your journey, you know, it's, it yeah. isn't just about the product at that point or the unboxing or the label. It's really about the customer experience. And we're, we're seeing that a lot in terms of that personalized kind of human touch means a lot right now in terms of connection, you know, to a product, to a brand, uh, even to the package. So I think that that journey is, uh, is very valuable to do. So I've got a, another question here. So this is from Brad. Uh, this, if you could explain this here, um, how do you make brands, especially the new ones, short on cash, uh, understand that the packaging in the first is the first thing they see and the importance of that? Yeah, that's a um, Brad. That's a great question. You know, <laughs> I think uh, when you're talking to a new client, and you know, I'll. I'm trying to think back here. It's in the last couple of weeks. I've had a few of those, right? Where somebody reaches out and they're really, really excited about their new product. You know, it's a startup. They they love this idea. They've fallen in love with their product, and they're ready to launch in the next two months. And they're like, "We want to work with you. What what can we do together?" And the first question is, "Okay, you've got two months, um, right? <laughs> That's not yeah. a lot of time. So you're you're limited to your options. Then we go into you know." Uh, just some general margin questions, like how much money are you actually making on this pack? What, what's it cost? Where are you making it? Um, and then you just, you know, I think through asking them the questions and explaining why you're asking them those questions, like what that's leading to helps educate them. And a lot of times when, you know, when I hear from somebody like that, I already know before I pick up the phone to talk to them that this isn't going to work out. Um, and by not work out, I mean, I'm not going to be doing anything for them other than, Educate them, educating them in this is everything that you need to know and this is what you're limiting yourself to. So you either need more time or you need more money or you need to do something stock and launch and then do something custom later. Um, but, you know, I think just going through those questions of that discovery and just, you know, I think if you've got like four or five good questions that you can ask them that help them understand packaging is the way to do it where they're answering it themselves, right? It's like, okay, well, you know, how much are you making on this $10 product? They're like, well, we're making 50 cents. Okay, well, you, well packaging's gonna cost you 40 cents. So how much are you making on your product now? And it seems silly, but I've had this conversation and all of a sudden they're like, oh, wow, I didn't realize that. Either, you know, we need to buy more of the product to bring that cost down, to bring our cost of goods down, or we've got to do something different. And, you know, a lot of times when you're producing, you know, some of these D 2 C brands, they're buying products that, are, that the manufacturer of the product will offer packaging um, like built into the cost. 
and they're just outsourcing it somewhere else that does it really cheap and they roll it into the cost. And a lot of times that's what you just have to launch with, right? Mm -hmm. You have to launch with bad packaging in order to develop your business far enough in order to, to make it, um, to get good packaging. And it's unfortunate, but that just comes, that just happens because of, of planning. And people always think that packaging that can happen afterwards. You know, that, that, you know, I need everything else. I need a website. I need a social media account built. I need all these other things. And then I can do packaging later. Yeah. I mean, you don't, you don't want to have the tagline launch with bad packaging. <laughs> what that is. You don't, but that, that's a, re that's a reality, you know? Yeah. And that, you know, and that's, that's part of that conversation is, you know, you don't have the time or the funds to create something custom. So, you know, here are your three options of what you can do with the time and the money that you have. Um, and sometimes I'll, I'll tell, I'll recommend that they go to, you know, a stock, a stock packaging company mm -hmm. or, a package, or a company that can do really low volumes. You know, they can knock out a hundred boxes or something like that. And it's like, look, right. talk to these guys, they can set you up. They'll buy you time. Once you've gone down that path, then we can talk and we can talk about your, you know, your 10,000 unit order that'll happen in, in six months or whatever that is. Um, right. It's, it's giving them just, you know, it's giving brands, uh, not necessarily a brand, but giving these startups opportunities to make some breathing room in order to get into good packaging. Because packaging, packaging takes time. You know, really good packaging is going to take you six months. Um, you know, a lot of times, uh, packaging can take even longer than that. So it, it's just it's if you're coming to the table too late, then you just need to work with somebody that's going to get you to the finish line and then buy you the time to create something special moving forward. It's great, great consultative service. So I want to talk about your podcast here to wrap yeah. this up. Tell us a little bit about that and, and then where users can find that and also how to get a hold of you if anyone has any questions. Yeah, absolutely. So um, yeah, at the beginning of the year, I spoke to um, I spoke to Adam Peak and he hosts a podcast called People of Packaging. And after we after we spoke and after I was on the podcast, I was like, Man, like, why I can do a, I can do a podcast. Let me try to let me try to figure this out. Um, and I, I talked to Adam. I'm like, hey, how'd you do it? What do I need to do? And, and he kind of set me up. And he was like, hey, he, he gave me plenty of direction. Uh, and I launched this podcast because you know it was it was the beginning of the year. It was this pandemic. We were all locked in our homes. We didn't know what on earth was going on. Um, so I got to you know got to keep busy. And uh, I developed this podcast. And you know. Adam's podcast really focuses on the people of, of packaging and kind of their history. Um, I want to focus really just on the nits and grits of packaging and sustainability. So I've, I've had um, Tom Zaki of TerraCycle and Loop on. Um, I've had uh, Nikki, out of, uh, Nikki Withington out of New Zealand um, who focuses on, on sustainability. And we kind of just get into, the, you know, get into a lot of these questions about you know, what is, what isn't recyclable? What is, what isn't sustainable? What does it even mean? How do you design for it? Um, and it's funny because like the more and more people that I have on the podcast, you start to uncover kind of the, the how confusing sustainability is. Totally, yeah. Um, and, and, and that's, that's my focus for uh, season three, which, is, which should be coming out here in the next couple of months, is just deciphering this confusion and really focusing in on what is um, what sustainability looks like today. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, pa it's package design unboxed. It's available on Apple, Spotify, uh, pretty much anywhere you get podcasts at this point. And um, it's, it's been a lot of fun. It's been, it's been great. Had a lot of great uh, agencies on uh, Pearl Fisher, uh, CBX, and some great brands on as well. Uh, Liquid Death, who I love. They're just a water company and it's water in a can. And the artwork and the marketing and the way that Mike looks at marketing is amazing. Um, you know, on the episode, he, you know, they have a can of, of water and it has a skull on it. And on the episode, he's talking about how they, you know, they had like six or seven grand to spend. And instead of buying ads, what they did was they took that money and they took all the complaints that they had on social media about their brand, people saying that, you know, you're going to hell, you're, it's, you know, all this stuff. They took all those comments and they created, they used them as lyrics and they hired a metal band to, and they launched an album, a, me, a death metal album. <laughs> and one, they sold the album. So they sold their marketing. 
uh, two people were sharing the heck out of this album and just the advertising behind it. And instead of spending six grand on Facebook ads, they bought this out, they created this album and got millions of dollars worth of advertising, you know, Mm -hmm. and that's what packaging can do, right? The the album was amazing. It looked beautiful. Um, The can is, is killer. Um, And that's what packaging can really do for a brand. And the water tastes great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Good. So uh, how can anyone get a hold of you? Uh, Your email address, uh, website? Yeah, I think that the best place to to contact me is LinkedIn. Um, You know, I've got all the other social media going, but um, uh, I I spend my time on on LinkedIn answering questions. Um, There's a lot of of young designers out there, a lot of out of work designers out there. um, And, you know, that's, that are either reaching out, sharing their portfolios, uh, because I do have a connect a lot of connections in different agencies. Um, I'm able to connect people, network people together, um, and then not only that, but then also people uh, in sourcing and brand within different brands that have questions on packaging. They're reaching out, saying, "Hey, you know, we don't need you. We don't <laughs> we don't need your services at the moment, but we've got questions on this material. Is it really as sustainable as these claims are? You know, and and just being able to answer those questions. Uh, and I, I love being able to provide you know, the answer or provide the where to go get the, the information um, and connect, connecting people. So I've got one one last question for you here. Yeah. So in your your eighth season of your podcast, so in five years, yeah. what will the definition of sustainable packaging be? It's going to be packaging that just goes away. You know, do we really, you know, how much packaging do we really need? You know, is it a way that we can, uh, can packaging be reused? Not in the sense that we think of, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to store this under my bed and keep my, you know, my Legos or whatever it is that you're storing in there. You know, is there, is there a way that I can return this to the brand and it can be reused? Um, You know, I think what Loop is doing is definitely a step in the right direction. Financially, it doesn't, it's not quite there yet, but I think uh, the concept is there. And there's a lot of fragrance brands that are out there doing the same thing where they've got like a beautiful display in retail. You bring your your empty bottle that you've purchased on your first purchase and then they fill it and there's a cost savings for you. Right. I think packaging is moving in that direction where it it's going to be reusable, but in that sense where it's refillable or it can be repurposed. Um, and that's just retail uh, type of packaging. There's a whole nother area of pack. There's a million different areas of packaging, right? There's automotive packaging, there's food packaging, all these different things have different claims and different needs. Um, I don't know what that's gonna look like. <laughs> uh, you know, that that's kind of the challenge. There's a yeah. lot of packaging waste in everything that we do, but that's the opportunity also is to figure out ways to reduce that. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the, uh, for me, just realizing how big packaging is over the last few years, um, beyond just the scope that I work with was when I was working with the team and they, you know, I was working on a project and I walked into their where into the warehouse and they're working on a pack, a box that was like three times as large as I am. It was big, it was gigantic. And I'm like, what on earth is, are you, what are you doing with all that corrugate? And they lift the lid and inside of this lid was a airplane door. So the door that you open up and it has the raft in it and all that stuff for like a 747, like that was being put into a box. And it, you know, it made me realize how little I know about packaging. And I've been in, in this game for a long time. You know, everything that you do, everything that you see, you know, from the brakes on your car to the uh, door on an airplane, like all that stuff needs to be packed. And there's a lot of waste in there. And you know, there's a lot of jobs in that, in that also. There's a lot of opportunity in, in packaging. So it's not just the box your shoes come in, it's like everything. Well, that's great. Well, thanks for the time. I encourage any of you to, to reach out. If you have any questions, you can direct message me or Avilio on uh, LinkedIn. Best way to get a hold of me as well. And have a great day and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Awesome, thanks so much.